job kids and a lot of proud parents and proud grandparents and we sure appreciate you so children you can go back to your uh, service master club I, I was trying to just do some computations in my mind I think on an average Sunday morning here when you take into consideration our children's ministry on this property our children's ministry uh, to the bus children and then our children's ministry to the Spanish children we have uh, somewhere between 250 and 300 uh, different kids children that we uh, have the opportunity and privilege to minister to and that's a wonderful uh, wonderful thing and we appreciate that let's uh, teenagers you can go to your service and then we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9 we're continuing on this series of lessons on prayer uh, from Jesus the master teacher and in today's uh, message lesson we're going to be in Matthew 9 I do want to tell you we just talked about uh, last week expectancy expecting God to answer our prayer and uh, last Sunday morning, this is very interesting, and uh, Carolyn Williams' daughter and son-in-law were here from California, and he is a pilot in the Air Force, and they were here for a visit, and on the way out Sunday morning handed me a prayer request, and it was a very personal request about, uh, about uh, children. They'd been praying about having children, being able to or being able to adopt and just everywhere they turned, it was being thwarted and they weren't able to, to have children. And then, uh, so I took the prayer request. Um, they, had, they had been praying, obviously. Um, on the tail end, I prayed, shared with a few people to pray. And, uh, and God answered their prayer. Just, I think, was it Tuesday, Tanya? You showed me the text that Carolyn is flying out there. But on Monday, I think they found out that there was a, a baby born and they were the parents that were chosen and so they have that opportunity. It's not certainly a done deal, but uh, Carolyn Collins had a picture of that beautiful little baby and and the proud uh, possible parents. Let's continue to pray and, and uh, really expect God to answer prayer. He wants to answer our prayer and uh, he... Uh, that's just his nature. And so uh, look at Matthew 9 and verse 36, kind of a different, uh, interesting subject for when we pray, but a little bit different than what we have seen. Look at Matthew 9 and verse 36. But when he, that's being the Lord Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And uh, so he was moved in his spirit, in his heart. Uh, and the reason was because they fainted. Uh, they were weary. They were uh, scattered abroad. They didn't have, uh, and, and the ultimate, they didn't have any spiritual leadership. They didn't have any guidance. They were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. In verse 37, then saith he unto his disciples, by the way, everything was always a teaching opportunity for the Lord Jesus. He, was, he took this opportunity of, of being up on a hillside, looking down into the valley and seeing uh, those, uh, those people down just going about their business, some of them probably not even realizing their spiritual need, and yet he took that as an opportunity to teach the disciples. He said to them, the harvest truly is plenteous. And that was true in his day, and that's true in our day. And he was not talking about the, the harvest out on the farms or in the fields. Uh, he was talking about the Lord's vineyard, the Lord's field, and he was talking about the, the people that need the Lord. And he said, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And then verse 38, he tells us how that relates to our prayer. He said, pray ye therefore, and he used the word therefore, re referring back to verse 37, the fact that the harvest truly is plenteous, and yet there just aren't enough laborers to get the harvest in. I don't know, I grew up in Iowa and I did not grow up on a farm for a season. Uh, we lived kind of outside of town, 
but uh, just just the proximity, just being there in a farming area and a farming community, uh, you you got the understanding from friends and people that did live on farms that there were certain seasons where it was all hands on deck. I mean, they needed everybody to help to get the harvest in and uncles and cousins and neighbors and everybody had to pitch in if they were going to have enough laborers to, to get the harvest in. And that's the similar thought that the Lord Jesus is teaching here. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And, uh, and I like that. I, I think that's something that uh, he is teaching us for which to pray. Now in chapter 10, Jesus is going to send out the 12 disciples, but before he does, he had one more lesson to teach them here at the end of chapter 9. And I like it because the, the first thing we see in verse 36 he gives us a little bit of an order of things. It says, but when he saw the multitudes. And so the first thing that happens is Jesus saw, looked out over the, the, the valley and saw the people uh, by the thousands that needed a savior. So he saw. And then the second thing that happened was he was moved with compassion on them. And I want you to teach, I want you to see the power uh, that is in seeing. And when we're seeing the right things, uh, we'll feel the right way. And when we're seeing the wrong things, we'll feel uh, and a lot of times the wrong way. And here Jesus saw the need and it caused him to have a heart of compassion. I was thinking of the old saying, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, when we don't keep the right things in front of us, in front of our eyes, that's why one of my favorite sayings about church in general is uh, keeping the main thing the main thing because if we're seeing and focusing on the need, the souls of men all around the world, uh, we'll have the right heart and we'll have the right spirit and we'll have the right approach. Uh, but uh, uh, when we never see a need or we never see people who need a savior, we never feel the burden or compassion for them. And we need to make sure we're seeing the right things so that the right feelings will follow. That's why it's important that we bring missionaries through. It's important that we get to see them and hear from them. It's important. I think Sunday night service with Brother Salazar, uh, just, uh, just hearing from a different perspective and hearing uh, from a different, uh, different viewpoint and how important that is. Uh, we need to, uh, you say, preacher, I just don't have a burden for the lost. I, I just don't have that heart, uh, that, that compassion and burden that I ought to feel. And, and I would tell you this, uh, that we need to get out and we need to go out where they are and we need to see the needs uh, that they have. I, I would encourage you to go out with a bus captain one day. I'm now uh, some of them are going out on Tuesday nights and then still others are going out on Saturday morning. I, I would tell you to go out with Brother Morrissey, our youth pastor, and go and visit uh, in areas where uh, teenagers live and have needs and just see uh, their circumstances and their spiritual condition and see if that seeing that need doesn't make a difference in your heart and your compassion uh, toward them. And I think we'll be moved like Jesus was moved with compassion. Now, I like that word moved because it has emotional, an emotional aspect to it but it also has an action aspect to it. Jesus was moved with compassion. It means that he was motivated or he was inspired or he was, it moved him. It touched his heart to see the multitudes wandering aimlessly with no direction and with no spiritual guidance. The need that he saw moved him uh, to not just feel sorry for him, though there was that emotional component, it also moved him to action. 
It didn't cause him just to feel sorry for them. It also caused him to do something about it, to feel the responsibility to get involved and to have a part in the solution. And so the Bible says that when he saw the multitudes, uh, he, he, uh, he, he felt for them, but he also did something about what he saw. It moved him to the point that he gathered his disciples together and told them and taught them the lesson in verses 37 and verse 38. So we're going to pray here in just a minute, and then we're going to kind of examine this, how this relates uh, to our prayer life, why it's important that we uh, pray the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest, not just here at Lighthouse Baptist his church, but all around our country and all around the world, laborers are needed and he will send them in response to our prayer. Now, before we do though, let, let's all just ask ourselves a little question. What is it that moves me? Uh, and, and maybe ask ourselves a question, when was the last time I was really moved Toward the lost or toward a, a family that was unsaved or maybe a co-worker or a family member who needed the Lord. And, and if it, it's been a long time, uh, we need to ask the Lord to burden our hearts and we need to get out and see the plight of the people that he had come to seek and to save. And uh, so let's pray, and then we'll get back right to verse 37 and begin there. Father, we ask you to bless tonight. Lord, we've been blessed by the children singing about the, the joy and the happiness that we can have uh, as we're obedient to thee. And, and Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for, uh, Lord, their their hearts, their spirit, their, their childlike faith and their enthusiasm about the things of God. Uh, we thank you for their resilience and how, uh, Lord, uh, there is in so many ways uh, you point us to the child uh, to learn. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, we, the adults in their lives, will uh, do uh, the, the, the work and the job that we need to to be the the parents, the leaders, the examples, the helpers uh, in their lives. And we pray that you'll bless tonight. Help us to learn just another little nugget in our prayer uh, lessons. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first thing we see in verse 37 was he, he told the disciples about the problem. Now, uh, sometimes we can see a problem but not recognize it as a problem. And so uh, the Lord Jesus, and oftentimes that was the case with the disciples, they would see the same thing the Lord Jesus was seeing and look at the same thing he was looking at, but they would not understand it. They would not process it the way he did. And so he wanted to show them that there was a problem here and there's a problem in our day. But he said the problem isn't with the harvest. He said, guys, the harvest truly is plenteous. He said, there are people everywhere, uh, people who need the Lord everywhere, uh, and they are wandering today like sheep having no shepherd, just like they were in Jesus' day, and uh, they're wandering all around us as you just, as we drive. Let, let's try to practice as we drive around town, not seeing people uh, in the sense of they're just they're just uh, people going about their business and their day but let's try to view them as as souls living souls for whom the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and whom he loves and, and let's try to view them that way and as we go about our day we'll also see the fields are white unto harvest but uh, all around the world uh, over uh, oh a I, I think right at 6 billion people in the world and, uh, and the vast majority of them 
are in need of a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and so the harvest truly is plenteous. And in another passage, uh, Jesus said, the fields are white unto harvest. And that is a picture of the wheat grain, the stock of wheat when they're they're ripe and ready to be harvested. You'd look across that field and you'd see the the white uh, or the the whiter tops uh, there. And some commentaries I I read said that it it could mean the turbans over in the Middle East, which is where Israel and where this took place, and the, the white clothing because of the heat and the sun and and so as they looked out over the valley they saw those and said their their the, the fields are white unto harvest in any case he was teaching them the harvest is ready he was teaching them that the need is great he was teaching them that the harvest is white and it's still white in our day so the problem is not the harvest uh, the problem is that the laborers are few. And that's what he said. Look there again in verse uh, 37. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And so, uh, now, now we can understand that, can't we? The average church doesn't have uh, enough people to help reap the harvest. Uh, the, the average uh, church doesn't have enough Sunday school teachers uh, to be able to, uh, to meet all the needs that there are uh, among the church, let alone reach out to new people coming in. And, and that's why as a church, we've always tried to, to not just be ready for those that are here now, but we've always tried to be ready and prepared for God to send us more. Why, why would he send more if we were not ready Ready to handle and, and minister to and teach and love and help the ones that, that are here now. And so, uh, but the average church uh, doesn't have a, a full choir. The average church can't run buses because of not having drivers or workers. And the answer is because the laborers are few. That's why there's not enough missionaries uh, going to the field, even to replace the ones that are coming off the field. Uh, If you study that out, there are more missionaries having to leave the field because of age than there are going to the field for the first time to replace them. And that's why we've got missions has got to remain the mission of Lighthouse Baptist Church. We have to send missionaries out just this year alone. In our missions program, we've been able to take on uh, five or six or maybe even seven new missionaries, but we've had three missionaries have to come off the field for various different reasons, and so uh, we've got to continue. That's why there are cities all over America without one independent Baptist church because the laborers are few. That's why it's so hard to find teachers in a maybe maybe a Christian school setting. That's why uh, 5% of the people in the average church do 95% of the work. And hey, I'm thanking God that's not the statistics uh, here historically. And we thank the Lord for that. Uh, since we've split the bus routes onto Wednesday and Sunday, uh, they've been bringing consistently about 50 more children to church than before. And, and there's really no limit. We've got the space we've got uh, well there is a limit there is a limit to how many we can bring and that limit is the laborers are few that limit is if we're going to run another bus we've got to have another bus driver we've got to have more Sunday school teachers and uh, and we've got to realize the problem is not that there aren't people that want to get saved or or that will get saved or certainly that need to get saved the problem is that with the laborers the laborers are few and so we see the problem the harvest by the way in 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 church 
ministry. We will never get to the point, no church will ever get to the point where we have enough laborers or too many laborers uh, for the ministry. That's just the nature of it. Uh, the more laborers we can mobilize and train and, and send out into the work here and, and abroad, uh, there's just that much more need and so we'll never get to that point. But we see the problem. The harvest is plenteous, but there aren't enough laborers, so what are we going to do about that problem? And that was the lesson that Jesus is teaching the disciples. Now, so often we, we just don't have the right approach. We just don't have the spiritual approach. Uh, so often we try to fix spiritual problems with uh, physical uh, with physical solutions. And so uh, ministry leaders uh, that, that need workers, uh, uh, what do we do? Do we cut back the outreach? Uh, do we, I like Brother Jason, is, is going to uh, take over our outreach for our, for our anniversary coming up and then beyond. And he was talking to me about next year and uh, talking about getting a big map of the city and, and trying to knock on 100,000 uh, different uh, homes and, and, and families uh, that live in those homes in over the next year in 2020. And I, re I reminded him, Acts 2020, uh, the Bible talks about every door, knocking on every door uh, that the Apostle Paul mentioned there in Acts 2020. But, uh, but that's, that, that's the approach. It's not scale back. It's we need to pray and, and enable and empower and energize and engage more laborers to meet the need uh, that we have. Uh, so often uh, we scale back the ministry instead. So often we ignore the problem and hope it goes away. Often, one of my pet peeves as a pastor is when, uh, is when we have a lack of teachers, and we will from time to time, and sometimes it's just a, just a one Sunday thing if, when several people are out of town, but one of my pet peeves is combining classes because we don't have enough teachers. I feel like that's going backwards, and we're not having the, the, the laborers and the workers that we need uh, to minister in the appropriate way. And, and too, often, but that, too often, that's our approach. Approach, but that's never the Lord's approach. Even after Jesus taught them this lesson in Matthew 9, we look five chapters later in Matthew 14, and there's a similar problem. Look, in fact, go there. Look to Matthew 14. We're going to come back here to Matthew 9 and really dive into the verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. But I, I just want you to see the Lord is, is very clear what the problem is. It's not the harvest. It's truly plenteous. In fact, the fields are white unto harvest. The problem is our labor pool, the, the soul winners, the teachers, the believers who are surrendered uh, to the will of God and, and engaged in the work of God. And uh, that's the problem. That's always been the problem. And that will continue to be the problem. And the answer is to pray. But look at Matthew 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, again, another multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them. Um, again, he saw it. He saw the need. It stirred up his compassion in his heart. But then it also caused him to move into action. Look what he said. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, Now here's the difference between the Lord and the disciples. Here's the difference between what his solution is and what our solution is. And I'm lumping us all in with the disciples here because when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place. They're looking at all the problems. They're looking at all the obstacles. They're looking at all the reasons we can't do anything for them or, or with them. They said it's a desert place and it, the time is now past. It's getting late. They said, send the multitudes away. And that was their solution. We can't do anything more. We, we've done all we can. Let's send them away. Can I say this? That's never Jesus' solution. That's never his solution. 
His solution is to pray, and, uh, and we'll see that here in just a moment. But he goes on to say, uh, send them away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. He said, no, that, that's not the solution. And then he turned to the disciples and he said, you are going to be a part of the solution. He said, you letting me use you is going to be a part of the solution. Look what he said. He said, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And so the disciples said, Look, we have no solution but to send them away. Jesus said, no, you are the solution. Quit taking the easy route. Quit taking the convenient path and, and you surrender yourself to be a part of the solution. This is the feeding of the 5,000 and, and we have a similar problem. Multitudes of people, all of them had problems. And uh, I was thinking about churches and, and the larger a church gets... Uh, the more problems that we have. It's just a matter of, uh, of the, 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 just the reality of it. Uh, by the way, how many of you have problems tonight? I've got problems tonight, and every one of us have problems tonight, big, small, uh, whatever. Uh, but the major problem here was they were all hungry, and the disciples' answer was to send them away, uh, get rid of them. In other words, their solution was if we get rid of the people we get rid of the problems. And so let's send them away. That's never Jesus, that's never his solution. Uh, he wants to help the people, minister to the people. He wants to save the people. And, and so uh, Jesus said, no, we're not sending them away. You are going to feed them. Too often in my experience, and I've been guilty of this, uh, just as you have, too often we are problem ignorers not problem solvers. Uh, too often we say, well, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. You know, that out of sight again, out of mind. Oftentimes we're problem shufflers. Let's just shuffle it on to someone else. Let's just pass it on and let someone else deal with the problems. That's what the disciples just send them into the village and let them fend for themselves. Uh, oftentimes, uh, but Jesus was the ultimate problem solvers. And, uh, and so let's get back to the solution, though, because what Jesus was telling them is pray uh, because you're a part of the solution. We're all a part of the solution. Uh, if, you ha if you lead a ministry in, in our church and you have a need of workers, uh, you're a part of the solution. We're all a part. We need to pray. Look at verse 38. And he said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, I like that because prayer is a pretty good answer to any problem. That's where it starts with prayer. Uh, we begin by engaging the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. Too often our attitude is only if all else fails, then we'll pray. Uh, Jesus' solution started with prayer. Here's the problem, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. Uh, the Bible says that we have not because we ask not. And I mentioned John R. Rice last Wednesday, his book, uh, Prayer, Asking and Receiving. There's another little phrase in that book. He said that every problem is a prayer problem. And so every problem we have that comes into our life, like the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Uh, here's 5,000 men, not including women and children. How are we going to take care of it? Every problem begins with prayer. Every problem that comes into our life, prayer ought to be the first thing. We ought to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. So, But look what he says. I like this because he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Now, that tells us why, uh, why God would be interested in hearing this prayer and answering this prayer. Because he is the boss, he is the ruler, he is the, the, the head of the harvest. It, it's his harvest. These people are his creation. Uh, the need is, is important to him. Uh, did, did you know the work that we're involved in is not man's work in any way, shape, or form? This is his work. 
Uh, did you know the church is not man's idea? It's not, it's not uh, for man's uh, approval or anything else of that sort. It is his work. It is his church. And he is interested in it being successful. I like what Matthew 16, 18, the Bible says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I will build my church. And so Jesus is interested in building his church. God, our Heavenly Father, is interested in, in mobilizing laborers for his harvest because it's his. And, and he's interested in it. He wants it to be successful even more than we do. And sometimes that's the problem. That's why it's so easy for us to shuffle off the problem or ignore the problem or send the problem away because he, he cares more about it than we do and what we need to do is, is align our interests with his and we need to feel about the things passionately about the things he feels passionate about and when we do uh, we'll pray the Lord of the harvest. I love it. I, I love the fact that, that when we pray uh, even though it's his harvest uh, we involve him in it. Uh, we, it's almost he wants us to invite him to help us with the solution to the problem. And uh, he, wants to, he wants to involve us, but he's there to help us. And so when we pray, I, I love it because he sees the big picture. And when we pray, he can move people and he can shift people around to get to the right place. It's his work. And uh, I love this. Hey, take your Bibles and we'll come back to Matthew 9. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real quick. And uh, I might be running out of time here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real quickly. And I like this because it, it reminds us that this work is not man-driven. It's not ego-driven. In fact, when we have conflict, the Bible is very clear, only by pride cometh contention. And so somewhere when you dig through all the clutter of our hearts, uh, you're going to find ego and pride is at the center of it. And it might be clouded by a whole bunch of other stuff and a whole bunch of things we've convinced ourselves uh, that we have the moral high ground. But at the end, it's, it's just pride. And uh, I like this. Look at verse 3. He said, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? In their day, they were choosing their favorite preacher. And uh, they were saying, well, Paul was the one that, that preached when I got converted. Apollos is the one that preached when I got converted. And Jesus, uh, or Paul's about to tell him, uh, you're missing the whole point. Your focus is not on the right things. He goes on to say, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers. Uh, they, they are servants of the Lord whom God used in your life. They're just ministers. They don't want, they don't want you arguing over them. They don't want uh, you to feel that way. Uh, he goes on to say, I, I like this, but, but they're ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. The Lord gives. Uh, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now certainly as we're active and we're engaged and we're involved in the things of God, he is going to reward us. But I like verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. We're, we're, we're laboring with him. And so uh, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers uh, we're the laborers in many cases, and, and so uh, go go back to go back to uh, Matthew chapter nine, and I've got to hurry, and and, uh, and I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. But uh, but uh, what's to do when we pray for laborers? In fact, in fact, uh, yeah, let's skip all the way down there. What, what's it do when we don't have enough laborers and we pray? Um, 
you know, I'm praying right now for more Sunday school teachers, bus workers, um, singers. I'm praying right now for more adult Bible teachers, for God to raise up lay leaders in our church ministry, not because we're not functioning effectively now, but because we need to be able to have more ability to minister to more that need the Lord. And, and so we're praying about those things. Uh, these, and I'm finding uh, that uh, when we pray for laborers, God does some interesting things. When we pray for labor, several things happen. Number one, we're spending time with the Lord of Harvest. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to spend time with him in prayer. It is so easy for us to get out and to get running and to get blowing and going and not spend any significant time with our Savior. And so sometimes I don't know that he doesn't put us in uh, labor type uh, circumstances so that we will slow down, so that we will spend time in prayer uh, with him and so that we spend time. We're, we heard that from the preacher Sunday night. God wants to spend time with us. Uh, he invites us to spend time with him. And when we do pray, we're acknowledging that we need him. And so when we pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest, uh, we're staying humble and dependent upon him. It, it, it keeps us from thinking we can do it on our own. It keeps us from thinking that, uh, man, I, I'm, a good, I, I'm a good recruiter, salesman, whatever. I can lay a guilt trip on somebody as good as anybody. That's not healthy ministry. Healthy ministry is where we understand, uh, Lord, we need you uh, to send and provide and motivate and engage uh, your people. We need the Lord of the harvest to send forth labors into his harvest. And it's a constant reminder to us that this is his work and his harvest. And then the last thing it does, as we pray for laborers, oftentimes he burdens our heart and we become a part of the solution. Uh, we become uh, a church like ours. We've got folks that used to teach Sunday school, that used to go soul winning, that, that used to be engaged in different kinds of ministry. And sometimes circumstances change in our lives and it dislodges us a little bit spiritually. Or maybe we take a step back uh, because seasons of life do change and we do have to adjust and we do have to kind of reorganize our lives sometimes to be healthy and, and to to stay healthy spiritually, but, but then we need to kind of, we still need to be engaged in the work of God. And sometimes as we pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth labors into his harvest, uh, he burdens us to be a part of that, uh, that solution. I've heard many missionaries say they were called to the mission field because a missionary came and they began to pray for an area of need and the Holy Spirit told them as they prayed, you're the one I want you to surrender to go be a part of that need. And so we pray. Now as a church like ours grows, the work can seem overwhelming at times. Uh, sometimes it can just seem like there's too many needs and not enough laborers. That's going to be a constant, continual uh, need and we need to pray. That's why we need to pray now uh, for future. But, uh, and it is overwhelming, but here's the key. We always have to remind ourselves whose harvest this is. Uh, we're not doing this by ourselves. In fact, I love the fact in Acts 1 and verse 8, he says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. He said, yeah, you've got to be a part of the solution, but you're not doing it by yourself. I'm going to help you and empower you. And, uh, and certainly uh, when we remember it's his harvest, it's his church. 
Uh, he's in control. He's in charge. Sometimes uh, things take a curve or things go a different direction, and it's always good to step back and just say, Lord, uh, whatever your will is, we want you uh, to lead. And so it's a wonderful thing. And so I, I just want to challenge us tonight. Let's pray, ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest all around the world. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, you know, a dozen or so uh, young people in different Bible colleges. Well, let's pray that God will raise them up and send them out. And, and uh, we've got uh, different staff that through the years and want to bring on other staff that as a church we can send out uh, to pastor uh, and start churches and plant churches. Let's pray that way. But then let's also pray, Lord, we've got, we've got needs here uh, for, to, to do uh, the kind of ministry to, to care for these kids and, and families the way you want us to. We need you to send forth laborers into this harvest. And as we do, uh, he might just kind of help us to become a part of that solution as we do.